we've seen a surge in steelhead use on two feathers. One is our spay hackle, which really is not true spay hackle. It really should have been named um, heron substitute because that's what it more or less looks like. That was Tom Whiting describing a popular steelhead hackle in their line. Dinosaurs, featherless chickens, and innovation today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Please click the subscribe button in your app of choice if you have time and if you've been enjoying the show. This will allow us to find and help a few more anglers out there. So smash that subscribe button with your forehead. In today's episode, I talk with Tom Whiting, the man behind Whiting Farms and the best hackles in the business. Tom talks about the Hoffman line, some lines that have never worked out uh, too well, and why his birds can't survive in the outdoors. Don't miss this one as Tom talks about the legendary Spaycock hackle and what uh, we can expect in the near future. So, without further ado, here's Tom Whiting. How's it going, Tom? Oh, just fine. Thanks, Dave. Good to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We're, we're, uh, we talked about this uh, yesterday, I guess I was letting you know, but we're starting up a, uh, a steelhead uh, steelhead season, or uh, sorry, a steelhead season. Uh, we've already had the steelhead season, but we're getting into a fly tying season, and you know, Whiting Farms comes up a lot. I know I saw a, a video out there. I think it was the Fly Fish Food guys. They did a little tour, uh, you know, of your operation and stuff. And yeah, your name's kicking around there a lot. So I'm hoping to dig into everything you have going there. But um, yeah, maybe before we get started, you can talk about how you got into, first got into fly fishing and then and then how the Whiting Farms thing started. Well, actually, I started Whiting Farms before I got into fly fishing because uh, my education and background and interest is poultry genetics. And so this sounded like an interesting project, and as I like to tell people, it, it sounded fun enough to do as a hobby, let alone a business. And so 30 years ago, or a little over now, I decided to launch into this with the idea that, oh, this sounds like maybe a little venture, I'll try it. So one of these days, I'm going to have to commit to it, uh, I suppose, after 30 years. But anyway, um, and it's been a more of an endeavor than I ever imagined it ever could be, and it's more full, it's multifaceted or more faceted than I expected, and all the different fish species, the steelhead being one of them. But mm-hmm. the mission of Whiting Farms is to try to provide the highest quality and value feathers for the people that tie fishing flies, and we specialize in chicken feathers. There's a lot of other feathers, but we haven't ventured into them or have, and then pulled back. But anyway, I've been doing this now for 30 years and uh, hope to do it for another 20 or 15 or whatever I can manage. Nice, nice. And so with Whiting Farms, I guess, you know, you went into the fly tying. What other, you know, if you weren't going into the fly tying uh, niche, where else could you have gone? Did you have ideas of going somewhere else? Yes, I did. And it's a sort of an unusual tale. But I started raising chickens when I was about 10 or 11 or something like that. And no one in my family did that. We would just have the suburbs. And I wanted, I like to deal with animals. And people thought I'd go into veterinary medicine or something like that. But I like to do production things. And I used to have different lines of chickens. And I'd always wonder what they, if I cross this with that, what did I get? And then, unbeknownst to me, I, there was a, you could study poultry science and when i found out about that i traveled around the country and visited departments and ended up in my own home state colorado state university which at the time had a really good program and that was great and that launched me onto it but i had worked in industry and for the usda and managed a, a production manager at an egg production facility for a couple of years but it just wasn't what i wanted to do my particular fascination was with genetics just always found that extraordinarily interesting and i tend to grasp it really easily anyway and i was getting a doctorate in poultry genetics at uh, the university of arkansas at the time and a movie came out called a river runs through it yeah which was malcolm mcleish's little novelette about has a little bit to do with fishing it's more philosophical and religious than everything else but and i think it might have had five minutes of fishing video (laughs) in the thing but uh that launched quite a upswing and demand for fishing things, all things, rods, reels, waders, and feathers. And there was sort of a need, and, and through a sort of an odd pinball trajectory of contacts, I 
heard about hackle production. I looked into it, and and that's when I, like I said, uh, it sounded like I'd do this for a hobby, let alone a business, because there's all these beautiful birds and long feathers, and it was kind of a niche business, a high margin, small volume. Mm -hmm. I contacted Henry Hoffman of Oregon and Ted Hebert of Michigan and other people in the industries and Car Kerry Quarles at Colorado Quality Hackle. And just while I was in graduate school, I clobbered together a business plan, of which I've never had the guts to go look at, even <laughs> 30 years ago. But um, I did it. If I would not done that, I was sort of destined to go into the industrial poultry genetics field. Okay. And that's huge, uh, you know, for people to breed uh, birds for meat, birds oh, sure. or and eggs. Foster Farms is probably the biggest company. Well, Foster Farms is a customer of those big genetic companies. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the, they just buy the breeding stock as a package. And there's primary breeders co like Cobb Vantrez or Aviagen. I've worked for two of them on summer internships because no, there's not many poultry geneticists in the world. So they want to get to know the young ones coming up. And I could have done that. And I ended up doing that in a small way. I uh, also breed birds for egg production and culinary meat lines and other niche products just because I like to do it. Oh, you currently and do that, that? Yes. And it's uh, very distracting and people are mad at me because it takes away from the fly tying. Uh -huh. <laughs> So uh, that's I've always got my the question. From it. <laughs> that's always the question with the flight tag because you know it's it's a definitely a small niche. Um, you know, so it's interesting to hear. You know, I, in fact, a lot of people I think have to do multiple things to to keep you know to keep the business going. What, so on the food, I mean, do you have any like if somebody was to ask, you know, what, like as far as the good chicken to to buy? I mean, is there? Do you know that whole background on what's good, what's bad? Well, I have my opinions on it. Uh, there yeah. could be contentious or whatnot. Um, but there is some that's kind of like you would probably not eat. Uh, I'm not a fan of the commodity chicken world, the bur uh, the genetics companies and all the big meat chicken, Tyson, Foster, yeah. Purdue, any of those, have done a marvelous job for producing very efficient eating chicken. I mean, the, the gains that have been made is, are astounding. And poultry meat is the number one of protein source yeah. of farm raised in the world and growing because it can be industrialized and the birds are so efficient, but they're stressed they kind of eat, drink and poop and then they get harvested at a very young age and it doesn't have a lot of flavor. So I no. specialize in gourmet lines that get out are great for free run. People have to pay a higher price because they're not as efficient, but they actually taste good. And in my mind have a little bit more dignity to them. Yeah. Then on the egg side of things, I have things called the whiting blues and the whiting greens, and they're high production blue and green egg lines. And I sell these in the western Colorado region. Then I sold the breeding stock to mail order hatcheries, primarily McMurray Hatchery, which I used to buy from as a kid, <laughs> ironically enough. And I sell them the breeding stock, which they put together and then sell the chicks. And then I also preserve rare breeds for the Livestock Conservancy and other groups and just to do it on my own because there's not a lot of industry or governmental preservation of these things. And those of us that are in this field are rather nervous about the state. And I've got a half a dozen breeds that are um, very rare, and we're just trying to have some different sources around the world preserving them. All right. And I've created new lines that are totally new. Huh. Uh, that don't exist, not just in the fly tying feather line, but in egg lines and meat lines. So you're preserving them, uh, and how is this like a cryogenic sort of uh, preservation of, or, or, or what is the preservation? I mean, you're talking for, say, a few hundred years from now, making sure we, we have those lines? Well, the, we, we have endeavored on cryo cryogenic pr preservation. It's a hard word to say, yeah, but um, uh, poultry semen doesn't freeze well. And of course, the eggs are eggs, and they don't uh, nope. uh, cannot be reproduced in that way like a uh, mammalian ova oh, yeah. egg can. But it's maintaining populations and managing it so the inbreeding doesn't accumulate. And there's formulas to doing that and how many individuals you have to do. And the strategy is to have multiple places in the world where these populations are reproduced and maintained. So if any one of them gotcha. gets wiped out, then they're not lost for good. A lot of breeds already have 
Um, I have some from Sweden that the Swedish university people want back that no kidding. my God and called a flowery 55. And so it's a small world, but if you're into it, there's, you know, there's concerns with, um, industrialization of agriculture and preservation and somebody, we all might be glad we have this different, broader array of genetic background because a lot of the meat chicken lines all go back to a few lines and those companies that own that, there's only a half of, you can count them on one hand huh. that own the entire poultry wow. genome. And that's another podcast subject that I yeah. to get into. But back to the feather thing, it is my foundation and cash cow and it supports all these things. Yeah. So that's part of my purpose in having the feather thing is there's great demand for it and how I feel better about it with, resource use, et cetera, is the people that are into fly fishing of any type are more concerned with the resource, That's the right. quality of the water and the runoff and yep. and recycling and things. And so I'm supporting them and that makes me feel like I'm doing, You're something, doing something that's good for the uh, environment. Yeah. As opposed to the, the mega corporations, like some of the ones we've talked about where they're, they're probably not as in tune with the conservation or protection of the environment. Right. That's, that's kind of the, yeah. I mean, you know, it seems like, I mean, it's interesting the gen, uh, the uh, genetics, you know, obviously we're, we're not going to have a, a ton of time to go deep into that, but it's funny back from my genetics, you know, stuff. I mean, I always, it's like the phenotype, the genotype, you know, I don't remember much, but I always think of that, you know, and, and the phenotype is, is kind of right. The expression of what you actually see. And, and some of these, these birds that you have there, I mean, what is the most unique, uh, if you were to look at it or see a photo of it that you'd just be like, wow, that, that is some different looking thing. Well, I've got some real, real oddballs here, including naked chickens, which is oh, a wow. great irony about, uh, <laughs> uh, for a feather producer, a naked chicken. One of them named Henry we had for years. He was ironically the oldest chicken. Henry, not, not, not after, not, not after Henry Hoffman, I hope. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Or some people call him the Colonel. That was yeah. another name, nickname for him. Uh, but he lived to be nine or 10 years old, which is pretty old for a chicken, actually. But a professor from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst uh, gave them to me. You know, <laughs> geneticists are always swapping genes. Yeah. And it has the scaleless gene. Wow. And feathers are actually highly elongated, specialized scales, like reptilian scales. And so this bird, its mutation, had a scaleless gene, so it couldn't have scales. And even on modern chickens, all chickens, on the legs... They have scales that cover them to protect them. It's sort of like armor on them. Huh. Well, if they don't have a follicle in the skin to generate a scale, then they cannot have a feather. And so these birds had the scaleless gene, so they didn't have any feathers. Wow. And so I preserved that just so somebody is, and they happen to be black. They happen to be fibromelanotic, meaning their skin's black, their bones are black, their viscera is black, their testicles are even black. No kidding. And I just lined up a a couple of, that's another little efficiency thing. If you want to preserve some genes, you kind of pile them all together and put them in a single line. <laughs> so oh, wow. I <laughs> so I did that. So I've got these naked black chickens running around, and they're really, I showed some uh, Danish guys the other, uh, last month they were passing through and visiting that are fly fishermen from yeah. uh, Denmark and Sweden, and they thought it was a hoot because I ran down one of these naked black chickens and <laughs> the thing is, the skin's very uh, loose, you know, like poultry skin is, but there's not a stitch of feathers on them. So the skin's moving and they're warm because they got a body temperature of like 104. Wow. And and so they're they're truly obscene, but um, if you got a sense of humor, then they're sort of interesting. So <laughs> how are we getting off on this time? No, no, this is good. I love this. Yeah, we're getting into black chickens and testicles and stuff like that. It's, it's quite the... <laughs> uh, so now with the scale, so this is, maybe we can go down that road for a little bit. You mentioned you know, scales of a reptilian. I mean, what is the, you know, maybe just briefly the reptil or the, the evolution there, how, how this, I mean, I guess they're on that same, I mean, I'm not a evolution, you know, uh, biologist or anything. How, how does that, how that all work? How do we get to where we are with chickens? Well, it, it's becoming more and more obvious that the birds are the surviving dinosaurs. 66 million years ago, a huge asteroid slammed into the planet somewhere near Yucatan and threw up such a dust cloud that all the, the predominant 
species, the dinosaurs, the land creatures, and even in the sea, were wiped out by that event. Yeah. And that would r- allow the rise of the mammals, and we would not be existing here and talking on the phone and doing a podcast yeah. if that asteroid not slammed into the planet, yeah. because we would have never had a chance to uh, supersede the dinosaurs who were very well established for hundreds of millions of years. <laughs> so anyway, the birds, which were small and agile, just like the only mammals to have survived then were only about a pound or two in size or a rat's size and things like mm-hmm. that. Uh, they survived. And out of that narrow basis of dinosaurs, the whole branches of all the different varieties of birds in the world evolved into the different envi- uh, environments that were presented itself as the planet recovered from that asteroid slam in. And so feathers were extensions of, of the scales. Hmm. And now they've found, particularly in China, uh, fossils where there's obvious feathers on the birds. And wow. so they're not sure why they were there. They might have been display, like modern birds have for display feathers, or they might have been insulation, although they're not really thickly covering the bird or the dinosaur. So that kind of begs credibility. And there used to be a, a fossil that was found in some Bavarian limestone, and it was named Archaeopteryx, which is yeah. Greek for ancient feather. And it's very famous because it looks like a lizard that has distinct wing feathers and tail feathers but it has a mouth with teeth in it and long back legs, and the front legs were feathered, obviously. And so that was the transitional form. But that's what feathers are, and they've just, through evolution, they've evolved into a miraculous array of colors and functions and uh, shapes, cool. like the birds of paradise and peacocks, you know, it's exactly. really a, and the non fly I mean, yeah. And penguins. And I mean, it's just a diverse, I mean, I guess the diversity of, of birds out there. I mean, I think of the diversity of fishes, of course, is pretty giant, mm-hmm. but I mean, birds, I mean, comparatively, are they fairly diverse? Yes, I think they are. I think of all the way from a little bee hummingbird, which is the very smallest bird that currently exists on the planet to the ostrich, which is the biggest, but by no means was it the largest. There used to be an elephant bird in Madagascar and other places. But think about how... It's more extreme than a chihuahua to a Great Dane. Yeah. I think a bee hummingbird is a couple of grams. Right. It has about 200 feathers on it, while the trumpeter swan has 20,000 feathers (sighs) on it. And if you've ever seen a trumpeter swan, they're honkers. Yeah. I mean, they're big. And, of course, an uh, ostrich doesn't have many feathers on it at all because it's so large it doesn't ba- barely need an insulation. So I would argue that the birds are more diverse than even fish because the environments they live in, you know, water is water. It can yeah. be cold or warm, but it's water. But atmospheric, there's a far larger array of environmental conditions when you're on land in, in the air atmosphere, and so that is allowed for the mm-hmm. greater diversity of birds. That's sweet. That's sweet. You know, that's a good. Thanks for the summary. I'll put a link in the show notes to the Archaeopteryx. I definitely, I know I've seen some photos mm-hmm. of that thing. It's pretty cool looking. So, and it's um, only about the size of a pigeon. People think it's large. Yeah. No, it's about the size of a pigeon. Oh, it's small. It's small. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize yeah. that. Um, and we mentioned, uh, we talked a little bit about Hoffman there, Henry Hoffman. I know um, mm-hmm. I, I'm actually out in Oregon. In fact, last night I was, uh, or yesterday I was out at the uh, local fly shop at River City and and Don, who was in there, he was talking about Hoffman, and he said, you know, because I mentioned that I was talking to you, and and you know Hoffman, who was such a had a big impact, you know, especially out here, but just on flight. Can you talk a little bit about about, about maybe him and how you came to connect with him and, and take? I think you bought his business. That's right. That was back in the late eighties when I was still in graduate school. I I actually got his phone number, Henry Hoffman's phone number, from the Kaufman fly shop in, oh, yeah. in Portland, of course, because they're one of his big outlets right there, and Umqua Feather Merchants was called um, Umqua Feather Merchants because Dennis Black was the first distributor of Hoffman Hackle, but that oh. uh, relationship was saver, uh, severed later on. <laughs> but Henry was grew up on a poultry breeding farm in California, actually, but his passion was fly tying and fly fishing, or fishing of any kind, I believe, mm-hmm. to be fair. 
And so he felt, you know, well, I know how to do chicken breeding. And, and he was a commercial fly tire in his early days. This would have been in the 1960s after he did a little stint in the military and was a longshoreman afterwards. But he, um, he would get a premium for any fly that contained grizzly because the Indian capes that uh, were mostly available for tying fishing flies back there, that was the one color that was lacking for those grizzly. So he wandered around a poultry show and bought some a trio of barred rock bantams, which was the start or the genesis. Uh, of his operation. Then he bought some from McMurray, Murray McMurray Hatchery through the mail, some breeders, I guess. And he just started breeding them. And what made Henry unique was he used, a, he took a, the tires perspective in his selection. He had literally pulled feathers off him, off the rooster, the candidate roosters for the breeders. And if they, and the ones that tied the best flies hmm. and rolled and split, just had a nice yep. uh, upright collar on them. Those are the ones that got used for his breeding program. So, and he was unique in that. The other thing was the, the, the grizzly bantams inherently have a little bit longer saddle feathers. So Henry said, well, I'm going to use everything on the bird I can. So he started using the saddle feathers and he liked those more because mm-hmm. they're easier to tie with. And so he developed a saddle. And so those are his two claims to fame is he really chose Time quality as a criteria, and that was unique. Gotcha. And then he really developed the saddle ahead of everyone. Yeah. So by the late, well, in the 80s, he was pretty well known about it. He was a small mom and pop operation with his wife and other family members working there. So he never got large. He uh, was a little reticent to do that. And many people tried to buy his stock. Even Mets came out and saw oh, yeah. it and Ted Hebert and him were going to try to do a partnership and call it H and H Hackle, but neither one of them wanted to do the work. They both wanted to get out, and huh. then other deals came and went. Colorado Quality Hackles, which is how I learned about it, that was a professor at Colorado State University who had got some Andy Miner stock, which is another lineage of Hackle stock that was available. It was actually more distributed. Um, and I think two or three deals fell down with that for Japan with a, some Japanese owners would have had it. But anyway, um, by the time I came along, Henry was getting more willing to do a deal. At first he just said, no, cash on the barrel head, do it. But after so many deals had fallen through and everyone wanted more of the feathers, but no one wanted to do the work. Right. Well, I came along and I wanted to do the work. And so we struck a deal, and uh, uh, I paid him a certain amount of money, then paid him off, I think, in four or five years, and then he shut down completely. And he still ties and fishes. He's in his 80s now. Yep. I haven't talked to him in since the last time I was at an FFF conclave in Montana. Uh-huh. Uh, same old Henry, though, it seemed to be. He just, uh, yeah, I think he's... He got out of it. That's right. I huh? think he's going strong. I think Don was saying that, yeah, he's... He's still going strong. He he did say he said, you know what, you got to get Henry on the show too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna work on getting uh, getting him on and chat about. Uh, we'll fill in some of the blanks here, maybe from the stuff from before when you sure. met him. And and I remember when I was a kid. So I've been doing this a long time as well. I, I remember, you know, uh, my dad had a, fl- a little fly shop, and you know, Hoffman's was that was the stuff. I remember it was like, wow, okay, this is Hoffman. This is this is uh, you know good stuff. And then and then I remember I didn't know what happened, right? But they faded, and then all of a sudden now. Uh, you know, obviously you're the, you know, you're the name. And, and I think, I mean, I'm not sure on the stats, but I had this stat written down the 80% of the world market. I, I, can you explain, is that, is that just for a certain type of feather or is there any uh, statistics you can share there? Well, actually there's no governmental figures on this thing because it's such a small little niche, but oh, yeah. you know, it's not even on the radar and there's no industry figures on it as well. I only go by what people tell me because frankly, I'm stuck on it chicken farm in western Colorado and I barely get out of town you know there's so much work uh and I know we have the majority I can't quote a figure on it I know in some markets we have close to 100 percent like Japan they're very uh very particular about their fly tying feathers and they have uh the largest portion of the fly fisher people tie their own flies there because fishing is a little bit difficult in Japan but Mm -hmm however many people they have there. and, and <clears throat> But anyway, uh, and so usually those figures are about dry fly hackle because that's what I started with and what Henry Hoffman okay. had and Ted Hebert and Metz. 
uh, Whiting Farms has branched out into other type of feathers, like steelhead feathers yep. and deep sea genetic, you know, the, what we call our American hackle. I've got a new line that's for freshwater streamer feathers called the freshwater streamer hmm. capes. And then we do spay hackle and cock de leon. I tried my hand at jungle cock for a while, but that didn't work out. I called jungle fowl for a reason. We're not in the jungle. All right. Um, and then um, I do other birds, and I have other R and D lines, and some of them become standards that we did from scratch, like the spay hackle or what I call the Brahma, which is just a, a great partridge substitute. And the cocktail they own has turned into a fairly massive product line, and the wet fly other stuff. So in that array, I don't know if we have any competition. I think a few other people do some streamer stuff, but that's a side of the dry fly. That's it. And is, but it's, and is Mets? it's a large proportion of our that's business. It. That's it. And, and Mets, is that's another company that's not around anymore? No, they're still around. Oh, I do not know what they're, they've been, they've, uh, Buck Mets, who founded that and was the first large pr- pr- producer of uh, quality dry fly or genetic dry flies, it was uh, become known. And when I got into the business, he had probably 80% of the world market. He was large. Uh, it's, he sold Buck did to Dennis Black of Umqua All right. in the mid 90s. That's right. And then Umqua, I'm not too sure how many times it's been sold since then, but yeah. I know two or three times because I've talked to all the owners, the subsequent <laughs> owners they want to. It's interesting. It's interesting because, you know, we've had this conversation on this podcast again. I mean, you're pretty much a, I mean, you've got a pretty small, well, I mean, I think you have like 30 people in your company. No, I only have 23, but for a hackle company, that's a lot. Oh, 23 yeah. full time and a couple of part times. It, it's quite a bit, but you're a, I mean, you're a privately held company, right? I mean, you're not. Yeah. And, and that's yeah, the difference. Total. We're, I'm not sure about Umqua, but I'm assuming that Umqua and some of those bigger companies are probably, uh, you know, more of a, there's probably a board right you got that whole process and i mean do you guys do you think your your operation would be different if you had you know more of that scale where you were owned by a bigger company i mean how would that be different well i believe umqua is owned by one man named hans bosch okay who's from the netherlands and lives in long island he's the actual owner of umqua now uh the other hackle producers there's bill keo and there's doug ewing in iowa um I'm a closely held company. I don't have investors or anything like that. I own it. And well, yep. my daughters, I've been gifting it to my daughters. Sure. Well, That's pretty cool. In, in a state planning. But it, yeah. uh, back to the, your question, though, the very fact that I own it all and call the shots is made, it's been a benefit to the fly tires because I've done projects that I would be hard to rationalize to a board that had power over me because sometimes right. it takes me 10 years or 15 years from the conception of a product line to it's actually when it's selling and you're making money on it. And I can give good examples of that. And I don't know how many boards have that long of view, yep. a long-term view of things. Uh, and some, and a lot of projects I've started off have never come to fruition. Mm-hmm. Some of them have been pretty easy no brainers like the Brahma was. I started that in the middle nineties and it by the early two thousands it's a standard material that even fly time companies buy. Same right. with the spay hackle. what's one uh, what's a product line that you put a lot of time into but actually never worked out? Well here's an ironic one. I I started in the late nineties uh what I, a streamer line and I had a wide array of colors. It was a small, stiff, non fouling uh, you know, the right proportion of link to width mm-hmm. bait fish type uh, hackle. And either our sales department didn't couldn't handle it or the market wasn't ready for it. So I put a lot of effort into that. So I, when it just wasn't selling and I was spending too much money on it and it was just building up, I wound it down to just a couple of core lines to keep the inadequate numbers so all that work had not gone for nothing. And then a couple of years ago, People kept asking us, well, do you have a little feather that's good for freshwater streamer, you know, actual fishing streamers you know, for New England and other places? And I, and, and that line, I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. 
and I'm expanding the colors. I'd kept it as black laced white, which is a real striking thing that we were selling some of. But then I've re resurrected the grizzly and now white, and I've got a silver badger in that, which covers most of all the freshwater streamer type color patterns mm-hmm. with feathers, and then we can dye on top of it. So that one sort of, I put a lot of work into it in the late 90s, wound it down for the 2000s, and about three or four years ago, I cranked it back up, and now it's a new product line, and we oh, really? the face. So, and, and there is a, it's not a big market, but there's a market for it. And so that's the mission of Whiting Farms is to supply the chicken feathers that people use for tying fishing flies. That's it. And it's nice and rigid and the barring's nice and it's the right size and it's getting out there and people are, are liking it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, and I wanted to talk, we mentioned, uh, you mentioned steelhead uh, hackles and feathers a little bit. I want to get into that uh, here in a second. But before we do, can you just chat about, maybe just take us really quickly uh, from, kind of you know, the egg to the product landing up on my you know fly tying table here can you talk about that process and and what it what it's like from maybe maybe from a chicken's perspective and from and what you have to do (laughs) from a chicken's perspective (laughs) well he's he's got a feeder in the water there and he's just doing his thing (laughs) yeah he's hanging out (laughs) it's now are these animals so how do you keep them from uh you know running around and eating each you know kind of attack uh getting in the dirt i mean are they out running around at all are they all in cages no, this is a very controlled environment. The fact that the most of the feathers we sell for fly tying are rooster feathers, and roosters by their very nature like to fight. They're polygamous species. Like They come from jungle fowl, and that's why they crow. Jungle fowl would crow in the morning. They're, they're a wild like pheasant from Southeast Asia and the subcontinent of India, and crowing is a territorial announcement to let all the other roosters know in the area where all the roosters are spread out to keep them spread out and they in the spring when breeding season come stake out territories and what females they can attract with their bright colors and displays in their territory is their harem they're polygamous so one rooster mates with a number of hens the hens go off lay fertile eggs hatch them and the roosters don't have anything with raising them that's typical of polygamous species and a, a, a cockfight is really just humans warped Right. use of a territorial battle for their own entertainment and that's where they think actually chickens were first domesticated for religious you know sacrifice purposes or entertainment like fighting cocks and then they became kind of absorbed into their little villages or or, or land holdings and uh, they realized well they could eat them and they lay eggs as well so that's 10,000 years ago they got evolved into yeah. what we call a modern chicken right now But anyway, the way we have to do it, and there's other hackled producers do it differently, and I'm not going to criticize them. That's their, I guess, their choice. But we've found no other way, and Henry Hoffman had the same way, and Bug Bats. You have to put them in individual cages. Hmm. The difference with Whiting Farms is we have big cages. And every chicken, roosters, gets their own feeder and waterer, so they don't have to compete for that because that's a point of contention. And they're spacious. They're very, even though they'll tear each other up and destroy the very reason you're raising them for, their feathers and their fighting activities, they like to see each other and talk to each other. They're actually a very communal animal. And uh, the hens are well-behaved, with a few exceptions. But um, So we put them in individual cages, and so we have these vast sheds. I've got 27 in the system now which staggers me to even think that. 27 uh, sheds, and is that within each shed, how many birds do you have? They vary greatly. Some are breeder barns. Some are the floor brooders where we raise the baby chicks from one day of age till 12 to 14 weeks when we cage the roosters up and leave the hens on the floor, and then they go to their own cages. And then breeder barns, I have three breeder barns with uh, oh, yeah. 200, no, I have 300 cages is there our cages per breeder bar is there a uh, i know the fly fish vid, uh, fly fish food guys did a video i'll put a link in the show notes to that and I, and I wasn't sure if they covered you know your whole operation but is there something out there where somebody can watch or, or read about kind of everything because we won't be able to hit it all today uh there's been a number of good films done the fly fish guys just are, are neighbors in utah we're on the western colorado they like to come out and shoot stuff i don't show or we don't video everything okay they're more interested in, in um 
in a, a, the a time. product in a thing because they that's what they sell. Oh, so right. there's there are a couple of good quality ones. CNN came out and did one called the Feather King a number of years ago, and the production oh, cool. qualities were very good. And they show the hatchery and the babies and the breeders. Nice. And then there was another one. Some Danish documentary makers came out, and they were a hoot. They were great fun. Stayed at the house. <laughs> fun people. And they did one called Tom Whiting, the Real Bird Man. <laughs> and it's about 25 minutes long, so it's more in depth. Oh, perfect. That's, that's awesome. And, uh, oh, I'll get links and out. A, and a week ago, the CBS sent out a film crew, four guys. It was the most professional crew I've ever seen. And they spent uh, two days photo, uh, doing videos not only of my farm and me and the baby chicks and all that kind of stuff, but they also had one of our pro team members tying flies. And then they went out and uh, fished and caught some trout. Oh, wow. And so, so they're going to, that's in When's production it? or and it's going to be shown in 2020. It's, so, it's called CBS Sunday morning. It will be a feature on a Sunday morning program. Oh, good, good. I'll, I'll try to find a link to that when it comes out and, and add that as well. What's the, I mean, when you see CBS and some of these f- few big things that happen, do you see a, a boost? Uh, I mean, obviously you're advertising, you're getting the word out for what you do. I mean, you've got the flight tying, but do you see a boost in your bottom line on when, when these things go live? I'm actually very conflicted about this kind of things. Uh, we don't do any advertising. We, we haven't for years. If people want feathers in order to find us basically yeah. which is nice so i'm doing it for informational sake and just for documentation like oh the, sure and uh so these high quality films like the cnn and the cbs and the danish guys is it's, it's sort of a history thing and i'm i have i kind of look at the long-term prospect of this i always wished i would have uh, they would have filmed andy minor who was one of the hackle producers that i know his son i just sent him some pelts yesterday and we're become pretty good friends and he was andy minor was like the johnny apple seeds of the hackle world he that's the, the foundation stock that went to mess and Colorado quality hackle and some of the Keo stock and and uh, mm. collins all the hackle producers came out of really the andy minor connection who got his some of his birds from Harry Darby of the Catskills? Who got it, anyway? It's, hmm. it's it's just a yep, it's a lineage connected. there, and it, and his son even gave me a big full portrait of him holding a rooster that we have in the office. Oh, uh, cool! I've been sort of a repository of a lot of historical information about the hacker world. People have been <laughs> yeah, sounds like sounds like you have a, a good uh, interest in it. it I mean, well, I guess getting back to the, the, the egg to the chicken thing. So, I mean, you talked oh, a little yeah. bit about it there, but we had, so you have this egg, maybe you can just bring us back quickly to that. So they have these okay. nice cages, but start with the egg and take us down. You know, is it pretty standard or just like you'd think you kind of keep it warm until it hatches? Well, no, we, yeah, we have a very modern hatchery and uh state of the art incubators. Each one holds 18,700 eggs. Uh, and I've got six of them. Well, I actually have eight. I have six setters and two hatchers where the chicks actually emerge in pedigree trays. So their identity, whether it's by individuals or by lines, all hatch out together. So when we pull them, which is every Friday we do this, it takes pretty much all day to process the hatches because with all the lines and the numbers we're doing these days, it takes that. But the eggs come from breeder uh, my breeders and I have three breeder barns and I'm, we go year round. That's a fundamental difference between whiting farms and the other hackle producers, as far as I know. And when I looked at it, when I was getting into this business, I go, you know, how they do it maybe makes sense to them, but it didn't make any sense to me from a production point of view, an economic point of view or a genetic point of view. So I, from the get go did things differently. And that's one of the reasons I think we've, yeah. Uh, uh, advance more quickly because of just yeah. the laws of genetics. But anyway, I spend agonizing hours going through the breeder roosters, testing their feathers, measuring them, counting the darn things. And there are different lines, and I almost know the lines as individuals, so hmm. like an organism in and of themselves. And I know what the strengths are and what the weaknesses are and where they came from and where they are now and where I want to take them. So when I see an an individual rooster that looks like it has traits that will advance that particular line. And I red flag and then I go back and 
in my quiet time and really scrutinize the birds. Henry Hoffman did this to a pretty good extent, and I do it to a more gotcha. substantial huh. plus pedigree information. But anyway, I put together the breeders, usually one rooster to about a dozen hens, although some lines are not quite as fertile because they're highly inbred, and that kind of takes away reproductive capability. We've had to resort to artificial insemination on some of the lines because they are uh, rather run down. What I found over the time is the best quality is in the most highly inbred lines because you're concentrating. Inbreeding means you're mating together individuals that are more highly related than the general population. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of that. And um, what you're doing is concentrating the genes that contribute to what we call feather quality. Hmm. But feather quality is just a multifaceted aspect of the rachis, which people is the center part of the feather, not the quill. That's only in the follicle, the barbs and the, right. the symmetries and the barb densities and the, light, yeah. the strength of it and making sure they turn perfectly and huh. all those kind of things. So I put together the breeders. And I select all, I pull all the hatches so I make sure everything's coming out and I know what I've got and I keep all this data available. And then when I put together the breeders, not only do I select the roosters and they come out of my production, I have a one generational production operation where I'm choosing the next year's sires or males mm. for breeding out of my production stock and I go through them all. And one of the reasons we've advanced is my selection pressure is extreme. It's less than the top one half of one of one percent of the production roosters become the sires for the next generation. And when you have that intensity of selection pressure, you make great advances yeah. or really putting together a powerful advancement. And I also, with pedigree information and physical selection, select the females. Hmm. Now, Ted Hebert, interestingly enough, and Andy Miner believed all the selection was should be done on the female side. Well, Henry only looked at the roosters for the most part. Oh. And um, and so I've kind of combined both of those plus discovered things on my own. And now that I've been doing it for 30 years and yeah. you know, my background and education and whatnot has sort of contributed to that wow. as well. And strategies and heritabilities and things like that. What's the most, is there a kind of a most amazing discovery of something of, I mean, it seems, it sounds like you do a lot of research and document. I mean, of all the years, is there anything that comes to mind? that's kind of something you didn't expect. Yes, there are a few things. Uh, recently, well, last five or so years, I've not been selecting for it, but it's happening on its own and I'm just watching it. I'm not, I'm just observing it. Uh, as I intensify the accumulation of genes that contribute to this quote unquote feather quality, what we're, I'm seeing on some of the lines or individuals is the, the dry fly hackle, which is the purpose of what I'm raising a lot of these birds for, is used to be just confined to the, uh, cape, you know, yep. the, the feathers on the top of the head and back of the neck. And then the saddle, which is what Henry Hoffman started and we've continued. Well, now, those dry fly feathers are showing up on different parts of the body. It's like they're invading other feather tracks on the on the birds. Oh wow! So I'm getting dry fly hackle coming out of the thighs on the birds instead of a fluffy like chickaboo type feather. No kidding! It's coming down their thighs, and then I've got some that are growing dry fly hackles off the top of their wing, uh, wings, and they're like ten, twelve inches long, and they're and they're huge. They're like size four and six and maybe eight and these birds when you see them look like woolly mammoths they don't look like a normal rooster at all because they got all these dangling feathers on them because they're very it is and it, it's happening on its own and it's part you're of not this for it. you're not and it's part of this and because don't i mean just like any animal i mean mutations and things like that that you can't really control is that is that what we're is that what this is or do you see any of that sort of thing where, where things happen just with natural mutations or is that is that something well, you've opened up two lines of questioning here. One is uh, mutations occur all the time, and whether or not they are even visible is probably not, you know, most of the time they're not, all right. sometimes they're even fatal. But when you're just staring at something so intensely like the feathers of them, you're more likely to see these mutations, and I have had a number of mutations. In fact, I can get off on another tra uh, tangent yeah. on that. 
but most of it is just the steady accumulation and intense selection for these traits is contributing for them. So the lines are mutating in their own way. Now, the interesting thing about this that uh, your listeners might be uh, not think about is whenever you go to such extremes of any animal, you know, there's some deleterious effects, especially because they're inbreeding. The first things that go are reproductive traits and mm. vigor. So they're very delicate. So they have to be absolutely pampered oh, or really? even express well, the, the genetic potential they have. So What would happen if you took that bird that has to, you know, has to be pampered, like you're saying, you know, you have it in these probably these really <laughs> nice, warm environments and just threw them out on the farm and let him uh, run, he run would, around? He would be, he wouldn't survive. No kidding, and, he wouldn't even make it. No, they're rather weak and delicate, but uh, we always select for vigor nonetheless. And um, they, they're just extreme. One interesting thing, though, is if you take the absolute best rooster at Whiting Farms and you made it with something that's not a hackle line, you get absolute barnyard feathers. You disrupt that accumulation oh, wow. of all those genes. It's gone. And it's not even sellable. You wouldn't even know it has hackle stock in it. No kidding. Yes, as I did that experiment early on just to find <laughs> out, and then I've occasionally, when I need to introduce a new color, just I've done that occasionally, uh, and I'll have to mate it outside to get that gene. I mean, it's four or five generations of back crossing to the high quality stuff before it's even sellable again. Wow, wow, and that's yeah. and that's just part of the. I mean, fifty right, fifty fifty right. The genes come from it's yes, a, half the male and half the female. Yes, it's a, a, <laughs> almost correct. You know, again, these genetics, I mean, there's so many questions here that, uh, you know, we're not going to get into. Um, I did want to jump into, maybe we can just turn it a little bit um, to the steelhead, because I, I want to talk, you know, obviously I've had some steelhead, uh, a lot of guests on here. If we talk about, uh, I mean, maybe just steelhead, maybe just talk in general about the steelhead ackles you produce and talk about what is your best seller. I know that, you know, with the spay flies and some of the stuff where, you know, you see out there, grizzly is a cool one. You see that a long grizzly saddle hackle on the back of a trailing off a steelhead fly is great but but yeah maybe you can talk about what, what your best sell, selling stuff is well uh, my understanding of steelhead flies long ago they were mostly schloppen type feathers and schloppen is a german yep. word that's sort of hanging and so they're wide and webby and they're uh they have movement in the water and whatnot uh some people experiment and there's predominant colors like purple and black and you know uh, reds and things like that um uh, what fly tires are particularly good at is being innovative. And that's one thing that's always sort of uh, pleased me and, and been a good challenge. You give them some new feathers and by golly, they'll figure out a use to tie with, you know, they'll finally figure out how to use it yeah. in very creative ways, innovative ways. And um, some of the lines that we produced have been adopted for steelhead. The first one was the American hackle, which is a genetic wet fly feather. So it's, diametrically opposed to dry fly in that it's not it's, it's fully webbed so it absorbs water and it's very stiff the rachis or the, the center mm -hmm. part of the feather is so it doesn't foul and it can be a big fly and whatnot so that was adopted and we had it in predominantly grizzly and white and a few other colors uh, but mm -hmm. recently we've seen a surge in steelhead use on two feathers one is our spay hackle which really is not true spay hackle. It really should have been named um, heron substitute because that's what right. it more or less looks like. Huh. Now, um, uh, so those have been incorporated because they're that's interesting huge. caves and they, they lend themselves to sort of uh, natural totally. fibers. Inherent, um, inherent's hard to get a hold of, right? Yes, well, it's actually illegal to use. So this is a substitute. So our spay hackle... It's probably misnamed. It should be called heron Aaron, substitute, just like awesome. the Brahma is a great partridge substitute. Uh, I've been in communication with a fellow named John Shuey from your part of the world. Oh, yeah. He and I have been talking for years about the legendary Spaycock. And when I was first um, researching things for feathers on chickens, I used to, I saw, I heard about the spay cock and I saw a few idealized portraits of it. It looked like a barnyard bird from Spain. I mean, from uh, the spay river in Scotland. 
but I could never find any, no matter how I saw it, or I couldn't get any specific information on it. So I was showing John at one of the trade shows some of our Coq de Leon birds, which is a fly-tying bird that I imported from Spain in the early 90s. And some of the feathers towards the, the rear end of the bird, right in front of the tail and the preen gland at the, uh, the large end of the saddle. He said these are the closest to baycock feathers he's ever seen <laughs> and he's researched this and looked at ancient flies from 100 oh, yeah. years ago or whatever yeah, he wrote the and, he wrote the book on classic uh, steelhead flies for sure yes and and at the recent show in denver trade show i had some cocktail on saddles there and he just flipped out <laughs> and so i went through and he described in, in great detail because he, he's an authority on it uh, what he was looking for and i go i know how i can do this and so that's the fun for me is somebody telling me what kind of feather they use. And then that gives me clarity in what I'm looking for. And I have the gene pool to do it. And I can create new feathers for that. So I actually went through boxes of space saddles when I got back from the show and pulled them out. I, a dozen or so of the ones that I thought were closest to what he described. And I shot them off to him. And then he's doing a new book, actually, on, on spay and deflies. flies. Oh, yeah. So we're going to feature them in that. And so we've cool. not recreated, but maybe stumbled upon a, an adequate replacement to the legendary Spaycock. That's amazing. I I had uh, John, yeah, John Shuey was on way back in episode 16 in the first few months of this podcast. And yeah, we, we talked about his books and he, he definitely is one of the, well, he's the editor of one of the big fly fishing magazines as well. So, yeah, no, it sounds like, and I'll put a link to some of those uh, materials um, in the show notes. And I guess if somebody was going to pick those up, obviously they could go to a local fly shop. That would be if they had yeah. one. But other than that, if they wanted to to buy, say, this steelhead, this new spay um, or the heron, could they buy this uh, directly from you or do they have to go to, where would they go? We don't sell directly to consumers. We're just like a manufacturer where the chicken farm to uh, yep. produces them and then we sell to all the, the specialty fly shops some of the big boxes and some of the distributors but back to your steelhead one thing that I this is often a different little tangent but it seems to be very uh, well received is I had this cocktail de Leon bird that I imported from Spain in the early 90s and so uh, I decided to make a grizzly in that line which it never had it had one called Escobar which is sort of like speckling and grizzly yeah. barring sort of together. But um, I said, you know, and I actually did it for a different purpose. People were asking for a large size dry fly for like hexagena flies oh, yeah. and variants and wolf patterns and bombers and all that kind of stuff. And uh, somebody suggested to me, well, because I get beat up more for large size tackle than I do small size. We've pretty well got the mid end of things taken care of. Oh, right. But, but uh, so... Uh, this person, I was lamenting, you know, getting beat up, not producing the large stuff anymore. But when you sell, when you select for quality and feather density, the saddles normally get narrower. And so the largest, and so this guy asked me, he's actually taxidermist, does the mouth of the roosters. Oh, yeah. He said, well, what's your largest dry fly hackle? I said, well, it's the cocktail. They only says, well, make a grizzly there. And that was just one of those outside huh. comments that gave me a, an idea. So I set about... And I use the Hebert grizzly because it's larger and it's more Mediterranean, like the cocktail de birds from Spain. Mm. And um, so I started that about five or six years ago. And uh, not only did it give me a large size grizzly, I mean size four, sixes, and eights in dry fly quality, but the, the, the size of the bird made these long trailing grizzly feathers and people are using them for pike, musky, and steelhead. And then we dye them various colors. And, you know, and sell them in what we call a predator pack. All oh, right, they're sort of attack flies, and so yeah. that's in the under the cocktail own oh, cool. tackle product line. And then we often sell them in half saddles because people like different shades of blue. Oh yeah, or different shades of red, or there's different combos. And right now we're exploring which ones are the ones that are more popular, which combos, oh, so gotcha. they can buy these long, sturdy feathers that are suitable for the pike, musky, steelhead. And long, and by long you mean? Uh, oh, 8 to 12 inches. Yeah, 
8 to 12 inches. And what? These are so sort of the northern tier states of the United States and southern Canada and Scandinavia is where these are really taken on. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Or, you know, you were noting, um, you know, talking about hackles. And I mean, if somebody was, you know, wanted to choose a hackle, I mean, do you have any tips on, say, where we stay on that steelhead line? I mean, how do they know what, what to choose? I mean, are all your hackles pretty much standard? It's all the same quality, or is there kind of a, a different grading? <laughs> the grading has to do with the value. All the feathers are of high quality. They're all off the same lines and whatnot. But the density of the pelt and the length of the pelt, if you multiply the count of the feathers and their length or whatnot, the higher grades just denote two things, uh, uh, the value or the cost per fly. So the higher the grade you get, it's the lower cost per fly. Or in the, in the dry fly capes, the higher grades have a greater size range of uh, the hackle. Oh. Our, well, our bronzes right now, which is our standard grade, it ties great into the 20s and 18s and usable uh, length yep. that size. And then it has all the 14s, 16s down to about 10. The upper grades get into like 26s and 28s. And huh. I even have size 32s. I push the sizes down on the dry fly cape down farther on the neck so the wider portion of the pelt has smaller sizes. And that's what people really pay for is the tiny sizes of usable length that tie well. Gotcha. Uh, so that's it. So, so that's just a bird. So you're going to, out of that egg that hatches, it might have the potential to go down to the 32 or it might not. Is that kind of how it works? And then you choose that? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yes, I actually breed for that, and the breeder roosters are stunning in its array and its quality. I mean, with that kind of selection pressure, it's it's uh, it's uh, they're 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 nice. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So if I was to tie up some steelhead flies, for example, and I wanted a little bit of nice long grizzly that was, you know, kind of stiff, but at the same time kind of webby, so it moved around a lot, um, but held its form you would recommend, I mean, basically anything I bought would probably be good for that. I wouldn't have to worry about yeah. selecting the, the, the right, um, you know, paying more to get the right stuff. The quality is not the issue. The grade when you want to pay for is the quantity of feathers quantity. you want to buy. That there belt. you go. And for the steelhead flies, it'll be Coq de Leon. We have loads of bronze. The silvers are just getting sucked up like a vacuum cleaner into Europe right now. And <laughs> but every generation, and because it's a new line, you know, this long grizzly um, cocktail of the birds, uh, next year I'll be even stronger in it. We'll have many more silvers. We get occasionally golds. Oh, yeah. Those things are like an octopus when you throw them on a table, they're huge. What about copper? Do you guys do a copper? Yes, we do a copper olive color, and yep. then we have a bright, what we call a uh, March Brown, which is really kind of an orangish copper color. It's oh, that's quite a good one. popular. And, uh, then we, and then there's some bright colors like chartreuse that really jumps out and it's rather shocking. Uh, but yeah, the coppers. And that's cool. Who are, you, that. who are you? Um, um, I had uh, Rick Takahashi on a past episode. It was, it was a really fun yeah. chat. You know, we, <laughs> we got into all sorts of stuff, chat, but he mentioned in there, um, that he was at uh, IFTD and uh, he was tying for you. I think he's an ambassador or, or a pro team. I'm not sure. Can you talk about your ambassadors and pro team and how you become one of those people? Yes, he's uh, Rick is one of our uh, pro team members. And he happens to be here in Colorado over near the Denver Fort Collins area. And he was featured in the CBS film. They went found him oh, no and filmed him tying and explaining feathers and fly tying and whatnot. And then they went out fishing. Rick's uh He's retired now, and so he's putting a lot of effort into his time, which is his great passion, and he's one of our pro team members. And that's their function is to educate people and, you know, share their love of fly tying and do demonstrations, and a lot of them do social media now and mm -hmm. uh, videos and whatnot. That's cool. Okay, so so when somebody comes up, I mean, if you look at your, your list of ambassadors, or, or, or do you have ambassadors, or is it just the pro team? We, we split them up into the pro team. And then we have ambassadors who are not as active in social media, but get around all these uh, consumer shows or tie, tie and do articles and things like that. You know, it, we get bombarded with people wanting to be a pro team. I members, imagine. And I don't manage that. Oh, okay. Too much of, yep. I got too much work. In the <laughs> yeah, you're doing the genetics. 
<laughs> and uh, so I and I'm not out in the field like that. I'm stuck in the chicken bars. Yeah. Um, so I, I I turn that over to other people and 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 uh, but we we get right now. I don't think we're making any changes this year. Is what I've been told. Uh, yeah. but maybe next year when we evaluate it, uh, sure. we'll look at it again. It's something to be managed. Yeah. Yeah. That's a major thing. How do you guys getting back to your hackles? If we stay on that steelhead game, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you test? It sounds like obviously talking to John Shuey is a great way, but how do you, how do you test those hackles? How do you know? I mean, obviously, you know, they look good, but how do you know that they're going to fish good? Is that just well, ambassadors? That is partly our uh, both of our pro team members and ambassadors. And there's people that are um, actually unpaid advisors to me. They just feel invested in helping us out from the early days, from day one in my business. I had people like Dick Talur and Dale Darling and other people that were just keen on making sure I understood how feathers work and teaching me how to tie and what they thought I should do on grading. So I've been the beneficiary of that. But because I do know how to fly tie and I do know how to fly fish, but it's not my primary interest. I'm the uh, I'm an objective geneticist, and they advise me on how to do things. And many of these R and D lines from the get go, I have targeted pro protein members that are this is their particular uh, avenue of uh, expertise. I'll send them prototypes. Say, okay, here's where it is right now. This spay hackle, say as an example critique it and and they'll yep. beat it up and say this is what you got to do this is what's right go. this is what's wrong and that's the guidance i need so and they'll often pick out like i'm asking john shuey to to what those saddles i said pull off examples of the absolute ideal feather and <laughs> send them back to me nice and write any critique you know this is why this is good or, or send even a bad one say this is what you don't want to do and it's that expert guidance and gives me an image in my mind because I'm the one handling the birds. That's what I think sets us apart from yeah. the other producers. And we're trying to satisfy people and as humanly possible on a bird, uh, produce the birds that they're satisfied with, and then give them more beyond that. Even gotcha, gotcha. No, that makes sense. I, you know, get it out to the best people and have them give you feedback. I mean, how do you deal? It seems like, you know, especially in the online space, you know, some of the, the criticisms and things like that. Have you ever had any any big failures you've you've kind of had throughout, you know, your career? And, and how do you deal with criticism or have you had much of that? Yes, I've had plenty. And if you can't, you can't tolerate criticism, you probably don't belong in business. Right. right. Uh, I've had, it's kind of gone in different things. Um, when the fashion feather fashion hair feather oh yeah this four week we caught a lot of flack because we're at the epicenter of that i was going to ask you about that because that's the funny we've, we've talked about that a little bit you know the old steven tyler with his big earrings and i think i mean people still have those is that something you still sell to that market we do sell a little bit to it but it's an absolute dribble compared to what it was it started in 2010 and i can take no credit for it it was some uh i think her name was crystal bostock or something I can't tell you how many people told, have called me up and told me they invented it and therefore they deserve a better price and access to all our products and everything <laughs> that's going on if I had all of them. But as far as I've researched it, in fact, I'm looking up at my little bulletin book and I have a paper clipping with it and it's Crystal Bostock. Okay. Bowerstock, who was on American Idol and she was sporting, she was from Oregon. She was sporting some dry fly hackle, dyed some colors in her hair, and the young ladies that were watching the program said, well, that's neat. And they, so it was like a fashion trend anywhere. Some prominent person does it, and people want to yeah. imitate that. So it went up like a rocket. But it, unfortunately, like the nature of fashion trends, they come down like a rock, uh, you know, because they're by very nature supplanted with some other fashion trend, right? Yeah. But for two years, it was wild beyond words. I, Website crashed. No we had kidding. People calling us. Uh, I think we were on the front page of PETA or something because they don't <laughs> like fish to begin with. But, you know, even sacrificing a rooster for his, something as frivolous as a fashion item has really irked them. Right. But as soon as the, it went away, uh, we, we, it's kind of backed off. Yeah. But I, I defend, or I don't really defend it. I know that these are the most pampered commercial chickens in the world, they've got to be because they're highly inbred. They can't 
endure uh, substandard conditions. We they're they're pampered yeah. beyond any kind of chicken, and that's one of the things I like about this business and why I never get tired of it. We we're always trying to make them better and doing a better job. We put up in recent years five more sheds, and these are state of the art buildings, a right. third of a million dollars a piece. And um, I mean, they're totally environmentally con- uh, controlled and just really they're... nice compared to chickens. And you have to give them that so they can realize their genetic potential. Yeah. If what? something isn't right, because feathers are low on the hierarchy of needs, you know, it's just survival first and reproduction second. If things aren't all right, then the feathers suffer. Yeah. It's not critical. So you've got to do everything else above that right for them to realize their genetic potential. Gotcha. Gotcha. What, what's the, I mean, if you look at, you know, where you're heading, um, you know, it sounds like you've built a, an amazing operation. I mean, is there anything, you know, what would happen if tomorrow you were, you were gone? I mean, do you, is this, is this, do you have, I mean, it seems like you're obviously the main person. Is there, is there a, a plan there to, you know, to keep this thing going or are you, I mean, you're a kind of a data junkie, so you probably have it all in all in the files. Yes, I do have a system and it's an ongoing system and somebody, if, if I get hit by a truck, you know, it'll carry on. I do have some staff members who I'm training up to take off shelves or portions of what I do. Oh, okay. Like my hatchy lady, Mary, can pull a hatch better than I can. Gotcha. Actually tells me to get out of the way. <laughs> but and, and I've, I've tried several other PhDs here, that, uh, but they just haven't had the passion or the hard work or really the interest in the project. I've got another guy, uh, an intern who's starting in January, in about a, you know six weeks from now, who found me, and he and he's he actually was breeding show poultry and had his own hatchery and was selling chicks, and he fa- and he actually fly fishes, and he, he heard about me and sent me some emails about genetic questions for plumages and whatnot, and I got back to him and he goes, "Is there any way I can come work for you?" <laughs> I said, "Well, maybe," and. You know, you'll have to hang up your other little company to do mm-hmm. it or something like that. But he's going to start here in January. We just worked this out this last week. Wow. So I'm trying to find apprentices that over time, yeah, because somebody, Kerry Quarles, as a major, uh, matter of fact, Dr. Quarles, who was, had a company called Carter Quality Hackle, he said it'll take you five years to learn Hackle. And at the, I remember hearing that go, oh, I'll figure it out faster than that. No, yep, I've been doing it 30 years. I'm still learning and it takes, it's gotta be somebody with some patience, yet some creativity and, uh, no hubris. They got to listen to the people that are buying the product. You know, if you don't do it right, you got to make it right. That's right. Yeah, and listen. the biggest thing we criticism we've endured recently is not producing enough. Oh, really? Uh, and we cannot keep up with demand on well, all of our dry fly lines and our spay line. Wow. Uh, I don't know what's really going on. Uh, I thought things were kind of leveling off about four or five years ago, and uh-huh. I increased some of my commercial poultry, you know, the egg and meat birds. And um, you know, it's going on. A little distractive, it, but it, yeah, that's it, our biggest complaint right now is we're not producing enough, and I, we supply all market sectors, not just the the hobby tire that buys at the local fly shop, but the big box stores and then the fly tying companies. We produce huge amounts for them, and we're struggling to keep them satisfied because it's their business. Yeah, and that's at least thirty percent of our business is just bulk feathers for commercial fly time that's, in the world. We sell to basically everybody. You said and that, and I think what's going on is that you know, especially the YouTube you know thing that's going on is that's just increasing. And Kelly Gallup, uh, you know, he was on in a past episode, and he said. You know, he kind of, you know, jokingly said, it's like flight tying is cool now, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of blowing up, so to speak. And, you know, it seems like, and then, and then you obviously, yeah, you're selling to everybody. So it would make sense that you got all this demand. I mean, do you have any point where, and there are some uh, fly rod companies, you know, Berkheimer, I know I talked to um, the founder there where they just, they make a certain number of rods and, and that's, that's kind of it. Right. And and if you, if you don't, I mean, do you ever think about that where you're just like, you know what, I'm going to produce this amount of birds and just, and that's, that's it. Or do you, do you just keep, you know, going, going, going until you, you know, or how does that, how do you think of that as you look in the future? 
I'm afraid by my nature, if somebody wants it, I'm going to try to produce it. And that's why we've grown and grown and grown. And I just need to keep staffing up and yeah. keep putting on new, better facilities and uh, taking out the old ones. Is that a challenge for you? Them. Is it, it seems like, you know, with, with the business side of it that, right, you, just like you said, you get the, the person with the uh, hatching barn that's maybe better than you. Is, it, is that a challenge, finding people to take over and maybe, you know, grow the business on that end? Yes. Uh, finding good people is always a, a strain. And even laborers right now, we're having, because of the boom in Colorado, is tradesmen and laborers was a little bit short. So a lot of my produ- uh, building has been all about efficiency in every way, like energy efficiency and labor efficiency and system efficiency. Uh, but I expect to continue growing. And as I staff up with other people that care about the position and the, the purpose and the mission of the company, and over time, we'll just continue to grow. I don't see a limit, like a Berkheimer thing. Yeah, I'm um, I'm here to supply people. I I don't know what the competitors are doing, and and they don't tell me. Yeah, sure. you don't keep up with uh, them, so you're not looking at your competition and thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm I'm worrying about where they're going. You're just doing your thing. I've never thought about the competition. Our competition. I'm trying to do the better job. It's more internal to what I'm doing. I know I can do better, and I, that's what I strive to do. And they're welcome to do whatever they want. I, I think some of the increased demand on us is they may not be producing as much, but I don't know that for a fact. Gotcha. Yeah. What what is? Are there a couple of resources that you could think of, or if somebody wanted to go deeper than we went here today on? you know, maybe on what you do, the genetics, the, if, you know, somebody really wanted to get nerdy about it, are, are there any resources where people can learn more about this whole process? Uh, there are, but they're kind of, uh, there's a lot of videos out, but they're usually short segments. So they don't get into the depth that I think, because we've gone into a fair amount of depth in this interview. Um, yeah. I did write in the mid nineties, a 90 page chapter on the, what's called modern hackle production and i delve into all the genetics and the history of the whole oh, wow. thing and it was published in a uh, 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 paul schmuckler ingrid sills book called uh, rare and unusual fly tying materials volume two nice i wrote the chapter i'd write a different chapter today because that was only when i was about six years into this now i've been in it 30 years but it's it's pretty advanced i'm supposed to be writing a book myself right now i've got some publishers lined yeah. up yeah but, uh, you know, it's got to do it in my spare time, apparently. So it's not really happening yet, but I've gathered a lot of information. Some days when things slow down, I plan on doing that, not just to, to celebrate what Whiting Farms has done, but I've got an idea about, you know, man's use of feathers for tying fishing flies and the trajectory of that and who are the early pioneers like Harry Darby and Andy Miner and Henry Hoffman and exactly. Buckman and all that. And, you know, the sort of generations that have gone through and where it's just like a breeding a genetic line, you know, where it began, nice. where it's now and where it's going. Yep. And I'll speculate on where it's going. Hopefully I'll get to that. That's cool. No, I hear you. That's that's part of why I'm doing this podcast. I'm trying to document the history. And that's why I was excited to have you on because I knew you you had a lot of the, you know, you've done the research. But, um, yeah, I'll look forward to that maybe down the line when you get more of this uh, information out there, we'll, we'll connect it to this podcast. Um, any other, you know, I mean, do you have a favorite, uh, kind of a book magazine or any, any other resources that you, you know, stay in tune with in the, in the fly tying space or do you, it sounds like you got so many people behind you that you, you kind of uh, have all the information, but you do a little bit of fly tying or are you mostly kind of doing the, just making the fly tying materials? I check the feathers for turning. I have to keep my hand in that, and I actually grade one line of birds just so I'm familiar with what it looks like on the pelt, and that makes keeps my vision sharp for looking at it for the bird. I do I grade the Hebert line. Gotcha. It's all these beautiful colors, and I like Ted Hebert. He's a great guy. Still keep in touch with him. I do keep uh, – I flip through all the fly tying magazines, like Fly Tire magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, that issue just came in for that just to keep up with it and see what people are saying, what are the trends going. The pro team feels yeah. uh, determined to keep me informed. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you don't have any problem there. So I'm glad for that. And then, uh, uh, but uh, 
creative people often send me ideas. Most of the product lines that we've developed have come from somebody out there saying, why can't I get this feather? Yeah. And How do that's you know? what I like to hear. Yeah. How do you know what, because I get the same thing. I get people on here and I love getting the feedback and I tell listeners like, Hey, if you have a, if you have a person you want to hear as a guest, send me an email. But the, the challenge is that I know in my entire lifetime, if I did an episode every week, I can't get to everybody. So how do you choose what topic when you get these ideas to, to kind of follow through with and research and which ones you're just like, ah, eh, I don't have time. Well, I try a number of things all the time. I'm always putting together matings. That's part of my fun. I'll spend, I'll spend hours in the breeding barn, you know, rearranging things and doing stuff. And then, because I kind of live it and drink it, um, I can see what it comes out of it, and this is interesting or that's interesting. And I've got a couple of studies coming up that I hope to do, because in the gene pool, Whiting Farms, we have the largest gene pool and for fly tying feathers and uh, different plumage colors. We even have colors here that don't exist anywhere in the world <laughs> that have been mutations that I've isolated, stabilized, and perpetuated. I call pewter. And so I'm going to do a study on the interaction of all these blue genes or dun genes and what comes out of that. When I developed the grizzly uh, cocktail de Leon line, when I crossed them in with the Heber, which has a bunch of other colored genes floating around into it, we generated a whole new set of colors for the cocktail de Leon that have never exist. One of them, my favorite, is called Fiery Ginger. You nice. take these out in the sunlight and they look like they're gold. Oh, they're cool. Well. The roosters are just stunningly beautiful wow well so i like messing around with that some of it's just serendipity chance yeah some of it people are directing me to do this and that i consider to be a fun challenge that's my idea of fun well i'll put my my, my little uh, feedback would be i love the blue i think that if you can go into some I don't know what it is, maybe a blue metallic or a blue something that, you know, because it seems like blue is that color, especially with steelhead flies, that is kind of unique. You know what I mean? It seems the purples, blacks, pinks are all your, you know, but but the blues are, are the ones that are kind of the key. So, um, okay. um, but, we do but yeah. Too. Silver yeah. Doctor Blue and Kingfisher Blue, we do the steelhead in those right now. But if there's also a powder blue. And then there's also a, what we call Italian purple or Italian blue done, which is actually purple. <laughs> oh, cool. Cool. Hey, I want to wrap it up here, but I just want to note before we get out of here, in the next uh, six to 12 months, anything new, anything uh, big we can expect from you or the business or personally? Well, I'm, I'm, I've told everyone at the trade show in 2020, I'll be much better in production of the dry fly hackle, and I hope by 2021, I'll be caught up. We're breaking our rear ends to do that. I'm, I'll be stalling another breeder flock next week. So it'll be six a year coming in. So that's the biggest news and probably the most, I think the most welcome news I can give anybody is we're going to, we're dead set determined to realize the, keep the up. Drive fight. Keep up. Yeah, that's perfect. awesome. And uh, one, yeah, I had one other question I wanted to uh, just check with you on as far as, you know, something that, you know, you've done a ton here in, in the, you know, in the fly tying industry. What, what is there one thing that you're kind of most proud of? If you had to pick that out of everything you've done. I'd say the whole company, because that's what I like about it. It's you're creating something where there w wasn't something. And that, that is not only bird lines and product lines, but facilities and staff and a system. Uh, I, I was born to do something like this. And mm -hmm. I, I'll, I don't see myself retiring anytime soon. I'll always be involved in it because it's like an, uh, an entity or, or something I've, created and i feel responsible to i also feel responsible to pre preserve these genetic lines yeah. a lot of them go back four generations and i'm the fourth custodian to it wow and a lot of work has gone into them and i feel a responsibility to manage it properly from a genetic point of view and a safety point of view and so i hope i can find people and maybe somebody out there listening to this podcast says you know what he just described is what i want to do and they'll get a hold of me and who knows what will happen that's it that's it all right yeah. All right, Tom, so if they want to find you, uh, just uh, whitingfarms.com or pretty much go into any fly shop or store and they'll probably find the Whiting Farms uh, hackles, right? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing our job. I hope so. All right, Tom. Well, hey, I appreciate you coming on and talking today about, I mean, we went into deep. I loved how we got into to dinosaurs and because my kids, my kids love dinosaurs, so this is going to be a perfect, you know, but we, we went deep. I don't think we went into a ton 
you know, there's probably a lot of flight tying and stuff and maybe questions we didn't dig into. So maybe, you know, down the line next year or two, maybe we can get you back on to answer some listener questions if you, if you have time. But just want to thank you for coming on today and sharing your, your knowledge. Um, you're more than welcome, and I appreciate your interest. All right, Tom, we'll talk to you later. Okay. So there you go. If you want to find all the uh, show notes with all the links we covered, just go to uh, wetflyswing.com slash 115. What's the best way to up your game this year? Get a guide. If you want to get a guide and head out on a summer steelhead trip uh, this year, head over to wetflyswing.com slash swing the fly, and I'll follow up with you uh, on this upcoming trip. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up this soon and hope to maybe see you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.